Pastor Adam said, my name is Jacob Bryan, and it's an absolute honor to bring the word here. Uh, Journey Church means a lot to my family. Like, uh, you guys are such a blessing. My three kids were born and, um, not born here, they were born again and, and saved and baptized here at Journey Church. Um, I want to share something with you guys completely unrelated to the message. So about 10 years ago, we were at my parents' house, me and my wife and my three brothers and their families. And it was around Christmas or New Year's, I can't remember, but we decided to do like a um, you put down like goals or prayer requests. It's like a time capsule, right? You put it away and you check it like five or 10 years later. So at the time, like my three brothers were like heavily involved in the church. They're going. And unfortunately, uh, I wasn't being the man God called me to be. My family, we were out of church. I think we were out of church for like six or seven years at the time. Not doing anything crazy. Just I was crazy lukewarm. This past Christmas, uh, we opened up the time capsule, right? So it's like, let's see what our goals were like 10 years ago. This is interesting. So mine were like some weight loss stuff, some like, you know, financial stuff. I want to share with you guys, if I can do it without crying, um, this is my older brother's prayer request from 10 years ago. Can we put it on the screen? This is his goal, guys, that my brother Jacob and his family find a church home that they love so they can worship together and grow in grace together. So you guys are an answer to prayer, not for just me, for my brother and his family. So this should also be encouragement. If you guys are praying for a family member, man, don't give up on your family, man. Keep praying for your sisters and your brothers. God will come through. He'll bring the prodigal home son. Uh, prodigal son home. Amen. Uh, so this series is called Bring the Heat. So Pastor Adam kind of challenged all of us to bring our best sermon. Good news for you. It's going to be my best sermon because it's my first one ever. Yeah. Bad news is also going to be my worst sermon ever, so we have that to look forward to. <laughs> so let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, uh, just thank you for this opportunity, Father God. I don't take it for granted. I know the weight that comes with it. So God, I need you to remove me. Remove me from the, just out of the way, Father God. Lord, I know you have a word for your church today. And uh, Lord, I just pray that every word would be anointed, would find good soil. Lord, I pray today is just a day uh, that we put a flag in the sand for you, Jesus. We praise things in your name, Father. Amen. Amen, amen. So today is going to be, or could be, a record-breaking day in the life of the American church. In the next 20 minutes, later on, I'm going to show you guys how Journey Church can do something that's never been done in the American church before. And I'm going to show you what the Word of God says about that. Uh, I'm also going to show you what I think is one of the most important and underestimated two alphabetical letters in the word. So I'll show you what the word of God says about that. But first, have you guys ever had like a, um, a situation where you couldn't look someone in, in the eye? Like someone sends you a text, right? In like a day or two and three and four, like I didn't return the text. And all of a sudden you see them at church or the grocery store, like, oh, I can't look at you right now. I didn't return the text. Or maybe last time you hung out with them, there was like an awkward situation. You kind of just avoid them. I want to share with you guys like a super embarrassing story. Um, at my old house, we had an HOA, and we used to get letters all the time about, like, the grass growing over the curb, right? It's growing over the curb. You need to fix the curb. You need to fix the curb. So uh, my edger was broke, and I was in no hurry to, like, kind of fix it. But, but one day, I was working from home uh, for Citibank. I was in my pajamas in the middle of the day. I look out the window, and my sweet wife, she was trying to be helpful, she grabbed a pair of scissors, and she went outside, like, it's, like, 137 degrees outside, and she's edging our corner lot with a pair of scissors. And since the neighbor saw that, he decided to come out and gather around her and beg her, please use our edger, we'll do that thing. So now I gotta come out with my cold Mountain Dew, my pajamas, and I have to look these men in the eye and tell them why my wife is out there doing the, uh, the edge of the curve with her scissors. So my pride was hurt. As a man, you like, you know, we're supposed to take care of the yard, we're supposed to do these things, my pride was hurt. So I know it's funny and it's petty, but for literally for months, I would avoid my neighbors. So I'd come home from like the grocery store, they're outside. I was like, you know, I'm gonna sit in my car until they go inside so I don't have to look them in the eye. <laughs> um, pride, pride can hurt a lot of relationships. So today I kind of want to dig in, can pride be affecting the way that we pursue Jesus Christ? Can pride be the way, can it affect our relationship with Jesus Christ? All right, so let's, let's look at a verse here. This is Mark chapter 7, 21, 23. 
For from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile a person. You guys see like the company that pride's put in with, right? I know a lot of men, like, when you ask for, like, prayer requests, they'll say it, like, nonchalant, like, yeah, I'm dealing with some pride, you know, we kind of, it's like, almost like a lesser sin. The Word of God puts it in the same breath with murder and adultery. Sin is sneaky. Sin is super sneaky. All right. Journey Church, we're family, right? Amen. Awkward question, and please don't say it out loud. When is the last time that you sinned? Do you remember it? Was it like a, um, did it break your heart? Or was it like, kind of like a speed bump that you kind of just went over real quick? Have we ever thought about sin and how it affects, is it like a blockage? Is it like a, a is it a wall that we run into? Or is it just like a, a quick thought? So there's a saying that says, uh, man, we all sin. I'm going to see if you guys can fill in the blank here because I've heard it like a thousand times, right? So, man, brother, we all sin. We sin every we sin every day. Where does the word of God does it say that we sin every day? I Man, I got caught up. So we have this uh, room over here that we call the Salvation Room. We just started like two months ago. And so, man, when people give their life to Christ, we like to get them away from like the noise and like walk them through what it means to be saved. And so I was back there about a month ago and I was like, uh, I was just trying to tell the person like our need for a savior, right? Because we, we, we have sin. So I was like, you sinned, I sin, we sin every day. I was like, man, why do I say that? Like, that's not, that's not a thing. Call, God is calling us to be righteous and to be holy. We think it's relatable, right? We think it's re like, that's why we say it. We sin every day. We want to be approachable. Like bragging our ability to sin is a pride thing. We're being deceived. Bragging about our ability to sin is pride. All right. So how can we change that? We need to be dead to our sin. How can we be dead to our sin if we keep talking about our ability to commit sin? The Bible says to put on his righteousness. righteousness. I'm going to show you guys a couple of verses here. In Isaiah, he has covered me with a robe of righteousness. Put it on. We have another example in Ephesians, chapter 6, 14. Stand firm then with the belt of truth around your waist, with a breastplate of righteous, righteousness in place. The Bible says put it on. Not to put on your own righteousness, but to put on his righteousness. All right, so there's a big difference, right? When you wake up in the morning, knowing like, man, when I wake up today, some point today I'm going to sin. Or we can do what Galatians chapter 5 says, and we can show that verse. Walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of your flesh. So if we walk by the Spirit, we don't have to gratify the desires of us to be angry, to lust, to have pride, to gossip, to lie. If we walk in the Spirit, we can deny the desires of our flesh. I choose option B over them walking up, waking up every morning like, you know what, someday today, sometime today I'm going to sin. What kind of life is that, right? God's calling us to be holy. All right. So here we go. I teased earlier, what's the two most important letters, maybe overlooked letters in scripture? Here's the two letters. It's E and D. So we're going to look at Romans 3.23. For all have sinned with ED and fall short of the glory of God. So that's past tense, I believe. I think I got to be in uh, English, but I think that's past tense. The Bible does not say for we all sin every day and fall short of the glory of God. The Bible does not say for all are going to continue to sin in the future and fall short of the glory of God. It's past tense. So what are you saying? Are you saying, Jacob, I'm not supposed to ever sin again? Like he's telling me once I meet him, I'm not supposed to sin? We'll see what Jesus has to say about it. Not once, but just twice. So let's go to John chapter 5. So there's two uh, examples I kind of want to show you guys. So Jesus heals a man after he was sick for 37 or 8 years. Let me look at my notes here. The dude was sick for 38 years. So Jesus healed this guy, then he tracks him down in the temple. Let's see what he says. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said, uh, and said to him, see, you are well, sin, sin no more. Another example in John chapter 8. 
This is an example. A woman, she was caught in adultery, right? And so the dudes gathered around. They're one to like throw stones at her and kill her. So Jesus comes over and kind of weirds them out a little bit. He starts writing in the sand. And all of a sudden, they just slowly eventually start to leave. So it's just Jesus and the woman. And he says, John chapter 8, verse 11. Go and from now on, sin. So why would God tell us to do something that it's impossible to do? Does that sound like the character of Christ? I know some of you are looking like, man, how am I going to get out of here? This dude's telling me like I can never do a bad thing again. Like I'm ready to leave. So I think the real question to ask, guys, is like, do we identify as being a sinner? Are we saved or are we a sinner? We can't be both. We can't be both. I'm going to show a scripture here. Uh, James 1.8. The Bible says a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. So if you're, you're a saint and you're saved over here, but you're a sinner over here, isn't that being double-minded? Maybe that's the reason why some of us like get knocked off track when like life really hits. We don't know who we are in Christ. And it's nothing that we can do. It's everything that he's done. God paid the price to make you right in his sight. That way we can stand blameless in front of him. What kind of relationship is it if we're always apologizing, right? So we just walk in sin and like every day like, God, I'm sorry again, I'm sorry again, I'm sorry again. Like if I have a relationship, I have my friend and every time I talk, he's apologizing to me. What kind of relationship is that? What would happen if Journey Church decided to put on his righteousness from the front row to the back row that we know that we can stand in his presence blameless, not because of what we did, but what he did? Would, would worship be so much sweeter if we could stand in his presence, look him in the eye, look dad in the eye? Would our quiet time be so much sweeter if we could look father in the eye and have that relationship with him? All right, message number two, point number two. It's going, you thought that was awkward? This is going to get really awkward. <laughs> JD. I want to talk about how finances can sneak in. I'm sorry, how pride can sneak into our finances in a couple of different ways when it comes to giving to God. So it's going to be awkward at first, but I promise it's going to turn out really, really cool. Okay? It's interesting how uncomfortable we get when we start talking about, like, finances. Uh, I mean, I'm heavily involved in, like, men's ministry. I'm like... Uh, I just love men's groups and like the accountability that it brings. And so in men's groups, like we give each other access to call us out on certain things. Like I have some men in my life. I said, you know what? Every once in a while I need you to say, J Jacob, how, when's the last time you prayed with your wife? And Jacob, what are you reading in the Bible? And like that accountability means a lot. One thing that we never touch on is Jacob, when's the last time you, are you given? Are you given to God? So somehow the enemy has like taken that thing off the table where we can't even talk about it. We can't even talk about it. Even in church, right? So we'll have calls for like salvation and rededications and healings. Man, when was the last time we had like a, a big call? Like, are you committed to giving? The enemy is so sneaky. You know, I think they pray with me backstage and Eddie Floyd calls something out, man. This is so good. The reason why he kind of hides pride from us, that's the sin that took Satan out of heaven. Pride is the sin that took the enemy. He wanted to be God and he couldn't be God. So he got tossed out. All right, so let's talk about finances. Who's with me? All right, so I'm going to show you some stats about Journey Church. But before we do that, I kind of want to talk about, like, the tie, the 10%. I got to be super careful here, right? So uh, I'm going to try to do this the right way. Huh? We got it. All right, so let's take 10%. Just let's, can we put it to the side for a second, right? So in the Old Testament, it talks about tithe 10%. The New Testament has the word tithe in it four different times. And it's not really a commandment. But instead of like preaching on that, it's a whole different thing. Let's just put it to the side. I just want to talk about can we consistently give and can we do it with a cheerful heart? Can we do that for just a second? Can we put tithe, like the 10%, can we just put it to the side for a second? All right. To kind of back that up. Let's show a verse here before we show the slide here. 2 Corinthians 9.7. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give. Not reluctantly, not under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. So it's all about the heart, right? So we're not checking off, ah, I gave 9%, I'm not really, uh, ah, ah. 
Give what God tells you to give. Give it cheerfully, and God will honor that. Um, if you don't know yet, Journey Church is super, like, transparent when it comes to their finances. Like, it's the first church I've ever been to where, um, I think it was, like, one of the first Sundays I came here. And they just had, like, the budget sheet up on the stage on a Sunday morning. Like, here's how every dollar is being spent. Like, I love the transparency of Journey Church. So, that being said, I want to show you guys from 2023 how we stand. All right, 2023, Journey Church giving. Total number of people gave 490. That's like 500 families, y'all. Kudos to Journey Church. Give yourself a hand for that. So Journey Church is super generous. If you guys ever have been here like during uh, Thanksgiving time, they'll put up baskets, right? Like, what do you like these 300 baskets be filled? Please take a basket and take it home. Like by first service, all the baskets are gone. They have to like scramble for some more baskets. When we do our backpack giveaway in a couple weeks, like that number just keeps going higher and higher. How many, what's the goal this time? 500 backpacks. We don't average 500 families here on a Sunday. I don't know if you guys know that. You guys are super generous. So every time you guys are called to do something, you're obedient to it. So that's why we're going to have a tough conversation like we're at the family dinner table. Is that cool? All right. Total number of recurring givers is 65. That's 13% of the journey church that gives consistently. Guys, we're... The national average is 5%. There's a problem there in the American church. We're tripled it. I'm, I don't think anyone here is proud of 13%, but we've tripled the national average of consistently given to God. And Journey Church, I just showed that, man, that's crazy. Like we saved 87,000, even though 13% is given consistently. Just, um, I just feel like the money here is very steward, uh, steward well. So uh, kudos to the leadership team here at Journey Church. Huh? We gave away 100,000 submissions. I left that off the slide. How about that? We tied our 10%, yeah? All right, so you might be asking, Jacob, what does this have to do with pride? There's three things that I kind of want to call out. The most blatant way pride comes into play with our giving, with we believed our money would be better used in our own hands rather than putting in God's hands. I don't think that's the issue here at Journey Church. I think we all believe that God can do <laughs> better with our money than we can. Number two, it might hit with some of you here. You might think, man, I need this more money more. Like I need it more than he does. So we're going to talk about that here in a second. The third way, which is super, super sneaky, it's more under the radar way. I had a guy tell me one time, he's like, so Jacob, I, like I can really only give like 20 bucks a month and it's kind of embarrassing to do that. Like I don't want to see like... You know, giving's not about you. It's about him. It's about what he's called you to do. So I just want to call that out, man. If that's in your heart, man, I can only give this little. And it's embarrassing, man. That's pride. And then we got to rebuke that. And I think he's calling you to be obedient with a little bit that he's given you. So there's an example of that. Thankfully, we can go to the word here. Mark chapter 12. Then a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth less than a penny. Jesus called his followers to him and said, this poor widow put in only two small coins, but the truth is she gave more than all those rich people. They had plenty and they gave only what they did not need. This woman is very poor. She gave all she had. It was the money she needed to live on, man. Does that sting a little bit? That stings, man. The money she needed to live, to eat, maybe to have a house to stay, man, she gave it. I'm not calling you to like miss your mortgage payments. I'm just calling you to be consistent in what God's telling you to do and give it cheerfully. The bottom line is journey. So we trust him with our eternal life. We trust him with our salvation. We can definitely trust him with our money. Amen. So we just had the offering for like the horizon build. If that 13% that we showed earlier, if that turned up to like 80%, we could probably just cancel the Rise and Build campaign. Like, we wouldn't even need it. Like, we would have a new building. So I'm going to do something super, super awkward. Earlier we talked about how the enemy's kind of taken um, finances. Like, we're not even allowed to talk about it, right? And so there's, like, this call. So my flesh is right now, like, screaming, don't do this. But I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> I told you guys earlier uh, we could do something that's never been done in the American church. And no church has ever had even 70% of its congregants constantly give. I'm not talking about 10%. I'm talking about give consistently, cheerfully. And so right now I just want to do, 
an awkward call to action. I'm going to ask you guys, and the amount's none of my business, and the percentage is none of my business, but if you're willing to give whatever amount he gives you and give it consistently, not to journey, but to God, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. Amen. Do the second service holds up their end, man. We might be breaking a record in the American church today. So praise God. Can I just pray over that commitment? Is that okay? Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for these men and women who said they want to do what the Word of God says, not just give cheerfully, Father God. So, Lord, we want to walk in obedience in every single area. So, Lord, you're calling us to, to live righteously. You're calling us to give. You're calling us to lead our families. You're calling us to pray. You're calling us to spend time with you. You call us to worship. So, God, we just want to uh, be a one-trick pony, God. We want to follow what the entire Word of God says. So, Lord, I pray for these families that have committed to giving. Lord, I just thank you. We're not promised that, God, would you show them the fruit of their obedience today? Lord, I just thank you for the blessing of this church and the blessing of their hearts. We praise things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, amen. All right. That was awkward. It's fine. Last thing on pride I want to talk about is how it could impact someone's salvation. So um, I grew up in the big church downtown, First Baptist Church downtown, and uh, I heard a crazy testimony. They had a deacon at the church, and he also was super um, active with youth, right? And so I remember one uh, camp, he walked down the aisle for salvation. So everyone's like, what's that story? So he shared his testimony. He says, God's been showing them that he doesn't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ for 10 years. But because he was afraid what everyone thought about him doing it, because he's a deacon, and he serves, and he does all these things, man. Uh, he let the enemy just kind of like, man, they're going to judge you. They're going to judge you. So eventually he had to swallow his pride and go down and, and accept Jesus as his personal Lord and Savior. Man, he was willing to go to hell for 10 years because of his pride. That's how strong pride is. That's how strong and sneaky pride is. Let's go to a verse, Matthew chapter 16. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever, whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. I'm going to go ahead and call up the, uh, the band and the prayer team to come up here. So guys, being a Christian requires us to die to ourselves and pick up our cross and follow Jesus Christ. Just because we recite a prayer, and get dunked in the water and put a title on it, does that mean we have a personal relationship with him? Unless you come truly, wholeheartedly, confess your sins and say, Lord, take me, break me, shape me, mold me, and make me like you, we can't understand who Jesus really is. So if you've never been allowed Jesus to come in and be Lord of your life, if you've ever doubted your salvation, I believe today is the day of your salvation.